My name is Victoria Bick and I am the garden coordinator for Dunnern Castle's beautiful restored kitchen garden. Okay. So we're here in the end of May. Yep. So what's happening in the garden at the end of May? Everything. <laughs> uh, we've just finished raking all of our beds, so forming our pathways and the areas that we'll be planting into. Our cold frames and our hot beds are uh, well, everything's coming up on them. The cold frames, we're starting to transplant all of our cold hardy vegetables from them out and our tomatoes and okra and peppers are going to be coming out of the hotbed soon enough. We're still fighting the weeds. We're already harvesting rhubarb and sorrel and Egyptian onions. Uh, we're so seeding, transplanting, watering. We're already starting to cut things back that are flowering too soon. Uh, so end of May, everything's happening. Our methods are very different. So most people get to start a lot of their plants inside under grow lights or you can just go out to the store and buy. Uh, even today you can actually buy a lot of heirloom varieties at various garden centers. They become more popular than ever. We however have to start all of ours in the garden, um, in the hotbeds and cold frames. Um, our way of treating the soil is different so we rely heavily on uh, compost that we're doing ourselves here on um, cow and horse manure that we've got some some farmer friends that bring that in for us um, so we're we're a little bit less industrial in our practice where you can just go and buy that at the store in bags we're getting it dropped off by the truckload um, all of the varieties that we're planting as well come from um, historic sources so most of the things growing in the garden actually are fall between the range of 1832 and 1862 so where you can just plant so whatever, um, the baby boomer tomato I think is a popular one this year, we're planting all the heirloom varieties. So the, um, the early large red, uh, the purple calabash, uh, we're making decisions based on what was available in Hamilton, Ontario in the 1800s rather than just what's available at the garden centre, what's striking your fancy today. And how do you deal with pests? <laughs> <laughs> um, Oftentimes, uh, in very simple ways. So we rely heavily on uh, feeding the soil so the plants are strong and able to withstand that. Uh, this year we've had a lot of trouble with flea beetle. So these tiny little beetles that like to jump, hence the name, and they will just eat holes in everything that is tender and sweet and lovable. Uh, so all of our baby radishes and arugula and lettuces all have these little microscopic holes uh, drilled through them. What we do is we seed a little bit extra, expecting some to die. Uh, we will seed in different beds. Uh, we've started some things in the cold frames where the flea beetles tend to not want to go. Um, and you just are kind of at the mercies of bugs. Uh, we tend to never have whole crop failures because we grow over 200 different varieties. So our, um, our French breakfast radishes this year were hit very hard, uh, but our rat-tailed radish has yet to be discovered by the flea beetle. So just by planting a lot of different varieties, uh, it, it's sort of hedging your bets against pests destroying one thing and then having nothing left. You're growing all sorts of vegetables here, you're growing all sorts of flowers, and then what? Like where, where does it go? Is it used in the castle? Yes, yeah, so it, uh, I'd say 95, 98% of it stays on site. So in Dundurn, um, we have the historic kitchen. So we have cook demonstrators who come down to the garden. They'll harvest whatever produce they need for the day. They'll use the old recipes and actually uh, get, they get to use a range from the 19th century as well. So a wood-fired range and they make uh, the recipes with the old produce, or not old produce, the fresh produce <laughs> of historic varieties. Yeah. Um, and then when people come through on tours of the castle, they get to sample whatever's being made that day. Uh, we also do a lot of our own pickling and preserving, so we make all of our own jams, jellies, uh, flavored vinegars, we make all sorts of pickles, and then in the winter, when we are still open to visitation, we serve those to the public. Uh, we also do we do a lot with it. Uh, we have birthday parties, uh, school programs that come through, we have cooking classes, we've got an Iron Chef workshop series coming up and so all the produce for that actually comes out of the garden. If there's any little bits left over, because uh, we do a lot in the castle, uh, we, we tend to sometimes share with visitors. People come through and they see things that they've never seen before, that they've never tasted before and we do enjoy letting people take small samples home to experiment with and uh, interact with. Uh, in their own recipes and then anything that's left over after that we actually have a partnership this year with the neighbor to neighbor center so they're coming um, in the season early right now they're coming every other week um, and then they'll be coming every week in the peak of the season to uh, load up we're averaging I think 10 big banana boxes worth of produce for them um, every week in the peak of our season and then they distribute it through their food bank so 
nothing goes to waste. It all goes to very willing mouths, either here or there. So you talked about using traditional techniques to deal with pests, to uh, grow in the cold frames, in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, there's people behind you weeding and watering and stuff. So mm -hmm. how many people does it take to keep this garden going? More than we have. <laughs> um, traditionally, you should have three or four people per half acre. Um, we have almost two acres here and we rely on um, part-time seasonal staff who also do a lot of work in the house for school programs and public tours and then we have a few summer students. So I think all together this year we have six staff um, that's a mix of full-time and part-time and seasonal. Uh, ideally, if we were going to have this at uh, Sir Alan McNabb levels of beautiful garden, we should probably have eight to ten gardeners out here year-round. And of course doing Victorian uh, work, which means ten to twelve hour days. Right. Okay. So can you show me around a bit and let's we'll look at some stuff? Absolutely, yeah, let's go for a wander. We have our beautiful Victoria rhubarb, actually. <laughs> uh, not named after me, named after the Queen. And so this was a variety developed uh, in the early 1840s. It's uh, one of the, uh, well, I think one of the best rhubarb varieties. It, it just grows how it wants and it's very happy to be here. So we get some really thick, short stalks and big leaves. We get some that are longer and thinner. People say they're more tender, but I think once you cook it into a pie or a sauce or a jam, you can't really taste any different. Uh, and we've got the flowers. So this is something that we do not want. Uh, they are quite beautiful, but uh, anytime the rhubarb is creating flowers, it's putting energy into making seeds and reproducing rather than making the beautiful leaves with the beautiful tasty stalks that we like so much. So we actually come through here probably once a week in this season and cut these flowers off. It's early in the year, so it's trying really, really hard um, to get some seeds set. It settles down later on in the season, is content to just uh, growing the leaves and restoring uh, the energy in the roots. This, these are hops. I've never seen one of these before. Tell me a bit about them. So um, hops are traditionally known for uh, brewing beer, or flavoring beer, I should say. Um, they're also being used medicinally. They're mixed with lavender in little sachets uh, to go under or around pillows uh, because the smell of them is actually supposed to relax you and help you sleep. Uh, we grow ours more for ornamental use. We do dry some of it um, and the Garden Club of Hamilton uses them in the house in some of our Christmas decorations. Uh, we just generally like having them because they're such a unique plant. I mean you can see by these ones they are vigorous climbers. Uh, we're we got a little bit distracted by some of the other things happening in the garden this spring and uh, normally right, now, right about now is when we string up the hops trellis and put the, uh, the string for them to climb. These ones are a bit over eager and you can see, well they're almost actually six feet off the ground already just climbing up the poles. So we're going to get in here later on today and actually string them. Um, so they're going to go almost nine, ten feet high. They're actually, they want to go taller than this. Traditionally hops trellises are strung on these giant, giant poles. Uh, sometimes 20, 30 feet in the air. We can't quite manage that here, so ours stay a little bit shorter and we just let them grow up and then hang over, which does make picking the hops easier. Uh, I believe it's in Germany, traditionally in our Victorian time period, people would actually walk on stilts to pick the hops. Uh, we've got a step stool that we use instead. So you got strawberries going here. Yes, yeah, and they are just about, well, they're not quite ready yet. You can see they're still very green and very hard. Uh, but they are they are definitely coming along nicely. Uh, since we were just talking about the rhubarb, we have to come to the strawberries as well because those are those two really wonderful um, early season sweetness crops. Uh, so we've got all of our strawberries in here. Now these ones actually were transplanted last year uh, because this bed had become so infested with weeds, uh, possibly because of the straw that we use, uh, that we had to completely redo them. But they're, they survived the winter quite nicely. And as you can see, we've had no problems with pollination and they're coming up grand. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we had to build our beautiful iris border was because uh, years ago our strawberry crop was so beautiful and so tempting uh, we ended up losing about half our crop to curious school children so we've built a wall of irises now to try to keep them back uh, we have we have other beds in the garden for sharing but these ones first priorities for the cooks for all the fantastic preserves that they need to make to serve to the public in the winter we all love it here uh, all of our staff um, we are incredibly passionate about this. No one actually uh, comes here with a gardening or horticulture background. We come from different fields. I studied history, we've got archaeologists, environmental science students. Um, most people just come into this job and realize they have a huge passion for growing food, for teaching people about how to grow food, 
um, how to make the most of the space in the soil that they have. Um, and the end result, I mean, we have an incredible space filled with a ton of varieties that you won't find anywhere else. Um, and we are a destination for people to come and visit and learn and smell and taste and uh, get a little piece of history uh, in their mouths and in their noses.